So uh, thanks for uh, having us. It's good to be here. We're going to spend uh, the next couple hours telling some stories. As Stephen mentioned, I, I think most people probably know that uh, Infinidad is essentially kind of Moshe version 3.0, so we'll talk a little bit about what that means in terms of the whole philosophy and design ethos of the company and, and the product, give you a little bit of background. I'm only going to spend about 15 minutes and just kind of give you a quick overview of the background and the history of the company, a little bit about the vision, and kind of turn it over to my, uh, to my bud Brian, who's going to get it to the fun stuff uh, as quickly as possible. So this is our agenda, again, pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time, take any questions. Again, uh, you know, Moshe has been at this for a long time, so he has a pretty, uh, pretty well-earned reputation. So what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit specifically about what's different this time around or, or what we've kind of built into this based on past experiences. We'll talk a little bit about the product at a fairly high level, kind of the business parameters um, around the go-to-market, competitive landscape, et cetera, and then we'll kind of get right into the architecture and the and the features and capabilities of the product, and we'll leave room for questions at the end. So as a company, uh, our sort of modest uh, goal for the creation of this product is to store humanity's knowledge forever. So uh, we think that we are in an era where obviously, and you know, we joke all the time about how we, we talk about uh, the explosive growth of data in every presentation, and our briefings included, by the way, have a mandatory reference to how fast data is growing and the fact that this growth rate is accelerating. It's not right? so, mandatory. Yeah, I know. It clearly isn't mandatory. And in fact, uh, it, should be, it should no longer be mandatory, and that's why we joke about it. But it's happening, and it's going to continue to happen. And more importantly, there are a lot of fundamental problems in humanity's scope of access and, 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 and reality that are driven by the ability to store, manage, protect and act upon data and information. And there's a million examples of it, which everybody knows very well. So the point here is that we've got to be very good at how we do this. And we think that the industry, or we thought that, and we still believe that the, the industry needed a different approach, a way to more efficiently manage this large and growing volume of data and be able to really exploit value from it in a way that won't break the bank. So kind of by the numbers, a little bit of background on the company. Uh, we are, as we sit here today, we've got over 250 petabytes in production. Uh, worldwide uh, with cloud providers. We've got some vertical affinities, which I'll talk a little bit about, but it's been a pretty well adopted solution across a lot of different industry segments. So we've got really strong traction in financial services, <coughs> including core banking, insurance, et cetera, uh, healthcare and life sciences. We'll talk a little bit about that. That's kind of an interesting one for us for a bunch of reasons. This is a little dark. I apologize. It's kind of hard to read that green uh, on the projector. So as I mentioned- Not as bad as the last guy's blue. Okay, cool. That's good to know. Thank you. That makes me feel better already. Um, this is, as I mentioned, the third generation. So uh, the leadership team of Infinidat, this is kind of our third project, if you will. The first being obviously Symmetrics, which continues to be the foundational architecture for a lot of products in the industry. Um, the second was XIV, which was very successful, sold to IBM, you know, still a product at IBM uh, that continues to be very viable and, and innovative. And this is now sort of version three based on what worked, what didn't work, what we learned from customers, what we learned from the use cases in, in the marketplace. So Moshe and I, founder, kind of everybody knows Moshe in the industry. He's sort of one of two or three, arguably two or three most influential people in the history of enterprise storage. Um, the question we often get is, well, you know, Moshe has been incredibly successful. He's, you know, built a huge fortune. He's been very influential. He has a great reputation. Why isn't he just retired and sort of off, you know, sitting on a beach? And the answer is because he, he still wants to continue getting it right and making it better. And he's incredibly passionate about it. He's in the office every day. He's traveling around meeting with customers. He's flying them around in his fleet of helicopters. He has more helicopters now, so that's different. That's something that's changed since the MC days. Um, he's incredibly passionate about this. Uh, and hit that passion is very viral throughout the company. So it's kind of a, a cool thing How to be around. How many helicopters can you water ski behind anyway? <laughs> Only one at a time, but we're working on a parallel processing uh, <laughs> algorithm to solve that problem. Um, so we've got some great support worldwide. Um, our customer base, again, one of the other advantages of having Moshe as your kind of spiritual leader is that it gives you access to some very large opportunities um, and gets the door open for you. So not surprisingly, a lot of our early customers are very large, uh, very conservative organizations that generally don't jump to new technology. Um, so we've had the opportunity to seed the systems in those large organizations and they have now come back and purchased two, three, four more times. So they've, they've bought into the technology, they're fully invested into it now and into the future. 
So if you select customer vignettes, uh, the first one, uh, and again, the, the, the good and bad of these very large global financial institutions is that they very, very, very rarely make public references. Uh, so unfortunately, we're not allowed to use their name, but uh, they are a US-based company with some Boston roots um, that has implemented, now I believe they're up to seven or eight uh, systems, a lot, they have a lot of systems. More than that. It's more than that, sorry, it's more than that. So they, uh, we went in and competed against uh, IBM storage as well as some EMC storage, <coughs> but predominantly uh, XIV and some DSAKs from, from IBM. Displace those, they're using it for tier one core banking workloads, they're using it for a lot of their uh, rating applications, which are real mission critical, time sensitive apps. Uh, and it's really changing the way they invest in storage. And again, I, I wanna reemphasize, because it's important, these are companies that do not leap headlong towards new technology, they don't take it lightly. They're very prescriptive, they're very practical, they're very careful. Um, so they bring it in, they vet it, they beat it to death, they test it upside down and sideways, which is fantastic because that provides tremendous input for us. And in then the a year later process. they actually pay you. Yes, exactly. And sometimes they pay us, which is awesome. We like it when that happens. So uh, the second one is a large internet security web and e-commerce company, again, um, replacing EMC, competing against VMAX and displacing some of their existing VMAX and VNX systems. Um, the idea here, again, is that we're getting, one of the things that we talk a lot about is consolidation and collapse ratios. Because of the high aerial density of the system, and Brian will get a lot more into this, we're able to bring multiple legacy systems down into a single system. Uh, we've got more than ample performance headroom and capacity headroom so we can get really, really good consolidation ratios. Um, this is appealing to companies that have a lot of <coughs> sprawl happening within their storage environment. So this is a good example. And there's great cost benefits as well. The last one we are able to name, Tricor, they're a regional uh, solution provider in New England. They're using this as the primary platform to deliver services to their clients. Um, they bought it for a bunch of reasons. They, they actually had the first production box in the U.S. and they now have grown as well and added additional systems. Um, the thing that kind of most attracted, it, uh, attracted them to the solution is that they can onboard new clients and deliver services to those clients much, much faster. So they can bring a new client on board in a couple of hours. The provisioning operations are incredibly simple. They can get the services deployed very, very rapidly. So uh, this is just a couple of pictures of our QA lab in uh, Herzliya in Israel. Um, you know, it's got sort of a 2001 Space Odyssey feel to it. Moshe kind of likes the funky futuristic architecture. Uh, the point of it is at any given point in time, there are always 100 petabytes of storage in our QA lab. Uh, and that includes systems that are ready to be shipped out to customers in production being burned in for a minimum of three weeks before they ship. So we do everything humanly possible to identify early term failures of any component in all systems before they go to clients, which is why we're able to deliver such a high quality product. Um, very strong application ecosystem, obviously working closely with VMware, uh, OpenStack, Oracle, and others. We've got customers, some of those customers I showed you earlier. Uh, we actually have over 100 customers now. They're using it for a really, really wide range of use cases, from relational databases to OpenStack implementations to highly virtualized environments with thousands of VMs. Um, it's a very versatile system, and, and it's interesting in that one of the things that we used to deal with with XIV was we positioned XIV as really a general purpose storage system. And, and that was at a time when being general purpose was really not in vogue, right? You had to be highly specialized, optimized, tuned to specific use cases, specific environments, specific application stacks. Um, so it took a while for us to kind of get that message to be accepted. This is kind of similar in that this is an incredibly versatile system. It's designed to be versatile. It's designed to support a wide range of sometimes very broadly variant workloads on a single system, and they're able to peacefully coexist and perform extraordinarily well. So uh, that's why we're seeing these large organizations that <coughs> for one specific use case, they're gonna use it for their you know, VMware farm, and suddenly they find they're starting to move more workloads onto it that are outside that scope because it works exceptionally well. And it's so Randy, easy. I would say from a startup perspective, I don't find a lot of companies doing a lot of burn-in mm -hmm. these days yep. anymore. You know, I, you can see that at EMC or IBM sure. or even Seagate, you know, in their drive mm -hmm. stuff. But most of the startups don't talk about 48 hours or however much time right. you're doing a burn-in. Yep. Why are you doing burn-in? So a couple reasons, and, and Brian can, can expound upon this. But the main reason is that this architecture is designed specifically to exploit ultra high aerial density <clears throat> near line SAS drives, right? So it's not an all flash system, it's a hybrid. Those drives 
fail. And we use a lot of them in a system, right? So this is an architecture that's designed to be highly resilient and designed to accommodate failures of multiple components. Um, so what we want to do with the burn-in is we want to ensure if there are any early term failures of any component, and it tends to be drives most often, we catch them before the system is put into production. Now, that doesn't imply that should it happen at the customer site, it's a problem because it's not. The system is designed to accommodate multiple device failures, no problem. We just want to minimize it. We want the system to be delivered with the highest possible level of reliability. What's your burn-in time, 48 hours, is that what you said? <clears throat> no, it's a minimum of three weeks. So each system that's shipped to a customer is brought in the lab and, and, and burned in for three weeks. All its componentry, everything. Yep. Yes. Correct. Under load. And by the way, it's not just the disks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. No. You know, we have a pretty sophisticated testing scheme for our supply chain, and we test everything that all the server vendors and all the mm -hmm. hard drive manufacturers and HBA people deliver. The amount of strange behavior uh, of anomalous behavior rate of incoming hardware, even when it's selected to be best of breed by us, um, is, is staggering. <clears throat> so what we found is you basically have two choices. You can do it like this. You can make the investment, build a lab, build automated processes, and do it before it gets to the customer. Or you can do post-mortem QA in customer environments when things get weird. And as Randy said, we've past the quarter exabyte mark of product shipped, and we have lost exactly zero bits of customer data in that time. This is the only way to do it. If there's a, if there's a more economical and more time efficient way to do it, we haven't figured it out yeah, yet. But I, I, a lot of the storage vendors actually do their own burn -in. I mean, you know, from a, not the drive vendors. At the component say, level, you know, sure. So they're doing probably a, a well, couple of days burning by themselves. Sure, right? but again, when you think about, and, and you know, coming from IBM, this was one of IBM's big value propositions around SVC was interop, right? So we manage the interop and worry about <laughs> it so you don't have to. This is kind of similar. Um, when customers are trying to do their own you know, OpenStack implementations or their own Ceph implementation, for instance, all of the integration risk is on them. They have to undertake all that risk. We think that's crazy, right? We want to subsume that risk and deliver a product that is as de-risked as we can possibly make it. In, in fact, I'll, I'll give you a specific example. I'm not going to tell you who the vendor is to protect the, well, they're not really innocent, but. <laughs> <laughs> so Sanctity of the tribe. He discovered something earlier this year where one of the tests, which is a hot upgrade, make sure that we can update and roll back microcode, was failing on some systems during the, what we call IVT testing before it gets on the truck and goes to the customer. And there was no rhyme or reason to it. There was no pattern to it. Um, and it took us about a month to get to the bottom of it. And to make a long story short, there is a certain component that we discovered where um, even if the model number and the version of firmware on this component is exactly the same. The only way to tell whether you have a, a bad version was a range of serial numbers that came from this vendor. And basically what happened was one of their developers changed one line of code, which was a timeout for a certain type of uh, operation. operation. Yeah. It was not documented. It was not in the release notes. It turns out that there were three people at this company who knew about it. One developer, her QA partner, and their manager. Volkswagen? Um, Are we talking? No. <laughs> <laughs> it was a diesel component, ironically. If uh, <laughs> you had built a software-defined system, whatever, and you would use these components, and you were doing hot upgrade the way that every modern system does, you would have systems that, where the upgrade failed mm -hmm. of the code. As I said, the only way that, that we've figured out of how to do this is to make the huge investment, to build a big lab, and to just figure all this stuff out before it gets to the customer. And so far, knock on wood, we're, we're batting a thousand in terms of reliability. Why is it this story does not shock me? Uh, pardon? Why is it this story does not shock me? <laughs> I, you know, oh wait. Moshe cares a there, lot about there is quality. Sir, there is version 5.2.6.8.0.a. Yeah. Version, but six. but there are six actual variants with right. that number. Yeah, right. Doesn't surprise me at all. Yep. 
So the point, though, is that we've, we've consciously made the investment in this infrastructure to make sure that we have the instrumentation in place to ensure the Mind quality. you, you see this at, at the big guys in spades, sure. right? EMC does it, IBM mm -hmm. does it, you know, NetApp does it. They all do it to some extent. Mm -hmm. yeah. And but you know, It's unusual for a startup, I would say. Yeah, and from a philosophical perspective, obviously we have huge ambitions. We're not done yet. We can't <laughs> be great at everything. And you know, we do very much believe in the, the mantra that uh, the great is the enemy of the good or, or whatever. What we've decided as a company is we need to have great unparalleled performance and reliability. Everything else is, is secondary to that. And that's what, you know, that's our ethos as, as developers and as, as product people is th those are the two things that you can't compromise on because there's no second chance. At these types of customers that we started and entered the market with, one it's strike one strike and you're out. Mm -hmm. And you're out for an entire cycle, you know. And so. word spreads quickly, so. And word does spread quickly, yes. Okay, so coming to near the end of my session. So again, basic design principles, um, being able to manage huge volumes of data, really designing functionality into the system that helps customers easily exploit and derive business value from that data, uh, provide incredible unparalleled levels of data protection and reliability, which we'll talk about when we get to the architecture. Um, get away from a lot of these kind of lock-in and these kind of vertically oriented integration plays and develop again a more general purpose, very open solution that can adapt on the front end to a very, very wide range of use cases. And do this, most importantly perhaps, at a cost that is sustainable, right? So this is not a solution that's designed to be delivered at an unattainable cost. It's not a luxury item. We want this to be a utilitarian, widely used, you know, very flexible platform. Where do you start pricing-wise? for the entry level solution. So the entry level system is the F2000 which has a list price of 200 and, or no 300,000 actually I believe it's around 300,000 for the uh, for the entry point. And then the big full system which we'll talk about primarily the F6000 series begins it's about a million list price. Obviously nobody ever pays list price. Can you upgrade the the smaller system to the bigger one? <clears throat> yeah, so upgrading from the the little brother and basically the only difference between the two is one has two disk enclosures and one has eight. Mm -hmm. So the process of upgrading from the small one to the big one is literally adding disk enclosures and plugging in a couple of SAS cables. And sending you a check. Right, we've decided, <laughs> yes. we've decided not to support this in production this year officially um, because the QA cycle for uh, supporting upgrades is, uh, is exponential. What happens if while this cable is unplugged, before it's plugged into the new port, if these three things happen in the same, I mean, it's, it's a staggering increase in complexity. So we decided that this year, if a customer needs to start small and grow big, we will give them a big system and we will do a capacity on demand model, where each quarter we just dial into the box, we see how much they're doing, and we just build them for however many, however many terabytes. They uh, they moved up to. Okay, but the the controller hardware is the same in both. Exactly the same. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Bravo for recognizing that the cogs of the bigger processor isn't anything. Yeah. And <laughs> life is simpler if you just go. I'll use the big processors for everything. There's other costs like QA cycles and agility and spares, the opportunity, opportunity cost costs. of other features. Spares in all the depots. Yeah. If just, we had done that, we wouldn't be, probably wouldn't have been able to get NAS out this year. Yeah. And our customers said NAS was more important. Okay, so just a little quick look at uh, kind of the competitive landscape thus far for us. Not surprisingly, we tend to go into opportunities where we're competing against sort of the established incumbents, uh, you know, big entrenched vendors, whether it's EMC, IBM, HDS. Again, we're getting great consolidation ratios. So when we go in and start modeling behavior and performance and capacity and headroom in these environments, we're finding the TCO to be very compelling. Uh, you saw some of those on those customer vignettes I showed you a minute ago. So we're seeing this great consolidation ratio, all the performance headroom and capacity, the sort of general purpose nature of it, you know, 65 to 80 percent typical cost reduction on, a, on an amortized basis. So it's very appealing, right? It's an appealing solution. Again, these are conservative large organizations that don't jump at new technology, so we have to prove it to them. But we have had great success proving it to them, and once they buy in, they come back and continue to invest. So that's been the story thus far. 
From a uh, use case and a workload perspective, again, probably not surprisingly, the bulk of it is really in kind of virtualized environments, so large VMware farms, you know, lots of virtual machines. We've got um, a lot of database and analytics, so whether it's Oracle or relational databases, large SQL Server implementations, uh, big data, some KVM OpenStack, you know, some data protection workloads. So it's a, it's a pretty good mix. There's not um, one particular slice where we're more or less likely to achieve success. Again. The system is engineered to be very versatile, so it can adapt and plug into a lot of these different workloads. Now, you know, full disclosure, there will always be workloads, very specific, you know, edge cases for which any given system may or may not be the best fit, and that's certainly true of our system as well. Nobody can claim to have a system that suits 100% of the workloads. Um, so when we go into these large organizations, we will likely encounter those two, three, four percent edge cases that require some weird homegrown configuration or an all flash array for whatever reason, uh, that's okay. You know, those are fine. We are not looking to subsume those workloads. We will happily take the other 95%. So what's a, what's a backup that? workload? So it's mostly just it's targets it's targets for data protection and backup, basically. So we so have for other primary storage to <coughs> use Infinidat as a backup? Yeah. Yeah. So these are um, mostly coming from uh, data domain mm -hmm. and customers are just they're so they're beside themselves with the licensing cost for data domain. Mm -hmm. And they need petabyte scale, super reliable, um, and, and we're very happy to do that. In fact, especially in the more conservative verticals like financial services, banking, Not a bad insurance, place to start. that's sure. often the first box that yep. goes into production. They just use it for backup to disk. Mm -hmm. right. And yeah. inevitably. And, and sometimes you actually have to restore, which is where we also have a huge advantage. Do you do so. have a QoS uh, mechanism uh, of some sort? Because the, the algorithm is huge. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. so, so. yeah, so what we have today is a fairness algorithm, but it doesn't have any knobs. Okay. Um, what we're going to be releasing next year is a pretty cool QoS implementation that allows, on a uh, per volume and per file system basis, to specify exact performance levels. Today, we have a fairness algorithm that makes sure that nobody uh, dominates, no initiator dominates the, the usage of the system. And also, on a per volume, per file system basis, you can turn uh, the SSD caching on and off. But it's going to get smarter next year. I can go into detail about the design if you guys are interested.